So in this learning objective, we're going to discuss the rise and the fall of the Whig Party and show how its downfall led to the creation of the Republican Party. And before we do that, let's just go reorient ourselves where we are on the timeline. So what we're talking about is around these years right here. 1834 is the founding of the Whig Party. The Democratic Party is its own party, so we're going to have a reestablishment of the two-party system. And the Whigs are going to last um, up until about 1854, and then we'll have the rise of the Republican Party coming out of the ashes of the Whig Party. So just want to reorient ourselves where we are in the timeline. So, where the second American party system established itself is, we, is with the rise of the Whig Party, which is first established in 1832. And what basically the Whig Party is, it's not too complicated to figure out where it comes from. It's basically a coalition um, to come after this guy right here. Andrew Jackson. Everybody is beginning to love to hate Andrew Jackson. And where people began to, to love to hate Andrew Jackson is out of the problems that he had with Calhoun and uh, Clay. But to, just to give a general um, idea of where the, where the um, coalition came from, it basically came from National Democratic Republicans who supported Clay um, and Adams' uh, American system. Um, and the Southern planters and state rights um, and other Jackson detractors, um, mainly northern industrialists who were alarmed at what was happening to the economy under Jackson by the time we get to um, the mid-1830s with the closing of the bank and um, the basically the paying off of the debt as well. And so Andrew Jackson begins to get this um, reputation as King Andrew I, so his detractors begin to call him this. So uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more details about where this coalition came from, but before I do that, the basic political beliefs of the Whig Party was that America was a classless system, right? Now, they definitely argue from their class, which is the elite class, the very rich, but what they mean by this is that America, if, if it has the proper economic infrastructure and as laid out by um, Henry Clay, meaning it has a strong national bank, it has protective tariffs to keep foreign markets away from um, our burgeoning economy, and it has a um, well-established infrastructure, then those that might come from humble means, humble means, if they work hard, if they're industrious, they can rise, they can transcend from their situation and become wealthy and successful in whatever enterprise that they choose. Uh, the other thing is that they believe that uh, elites should govern um, the political institutions. Uh, they would argue it's natural. This is just the way it's supposed to be. Um, and then they, they strongly argued to promote uh, industrialization and economic growth. Now, all of these things were counter to what uh, Andrew Jackson had been arguing, right? So his political rhetoric definitely um, argued that there was a class system in America. So as we look back at some of the things that um, appealed, people appeal, find, found appealing of Andrew Jackson, the fact that he would point out that the bankers um, and the, industrial, the northern industrialists had the system rigged against the poor farmers um, and the American workers in the system. Um, and definitely arguing that there was a class system. And so he, he argued against that. His very existence as president um, came in conflict with this idea that the elites should govern, right? He is a poor, he comes from poor and humble means. He's not poor, he's able to rise above his, his situation, but he came from very humble means and very uneducated. He didn't have a formal education education. So this is something the Whigs would say is a disaster for the American political system and the American economy. And he, he was a Jeffersonian in the, in the sense that he believed that America would prosper with independent yeoman farmers across the countryside being in, independent of each other and we would have an uncorrupt American system. Um, 
So to get into where the coalition came from, it came from these two individuals. One, Henry um, Calhoun, uh, not Henry Calhoun, uh, Cal Senator Calhoun, who was a Southern Whig. Um, he is, as you remember from the last lecture, is going to become angry with um, Jackson over the nullification crisis. And so you're going to have this group of people that will follow Calhoun under the banner of states' rights. Um, Clay is going to lead the Northern Whigs, and he is going to begin de to detest Jackson because of, uh, of his attack on the second American bank um, and his continuous vetoing of, of tariffs and of vetoing of further infrastructure projects. And so the significance of this coalition and the significance of the rise of the Whig Party is it was a national party that represented the interests of both the uh, large industrial and planter aristocracy at once and provided a means by which two economic groups uh, could possibly work out their differences. And so that they were, in, in other words, they were in dialogue with each other. So out of this coalition, the Whigs are going to get an opportunity to get into the federal government to rise to power um, once the economy begins to falter under Jacksonian democracy. So after Jackson leaves office, the economy begins to falter under the weight of what the Whigs would argue, his economic programs. Um, and so the economy begins to collapse in 1837. And this gives the Whigs an opportunity to take power um, in 1840. So um, the president after Jackson is Van Buren. Van Buren is basically a carbon copy of Jackson at this point. And so the Whigs are able to defeat Van Buren quite easily in this election. Um, this guy right here he becomes the ninth president. Harrison wins. And the problem with Harrison isn't that he is a, a, he's a bad president. It's that he isn't president for very long. And so a lot of historians play um, what if with this guy because he did have a pretty strong backing. Um, he had strong personal connections with much of the leadership throughout the country, and he was a very um, strident Whig. And so he could have probably instituted a lot of Whig policies and continued Clay's American system. John Tyler, though, is going to become president after Harrison dies. Basically, Harrison dies because he... Um, parties too long <laughs> after his inauguration. Um, he, it's raining, it's cold, and he contracts pneumonia, and he dies a month later into the presidency. When John Tyler um, takes the presidency, we find out we have a renegade in the White House, a renegade actually from the perspective of the Whigs. Um, he was only really a Whig from the perspective of uh, the minimum qualification of being a Whig, of that of hating Andrew Jackson. But he um, is going to defeat the plans for creating um, uh, another national bank. And so he's going to go against Clay on that. He's going to defeat tariffs, and he's also going to veto um, infrastructure um, bills that come to his house, right? And so this is a disaster for the Whigs. The entire cabinet that was appointed by Harrison resigns in protest over Tyler's, uh, what they view is his, his recklessness. Um, and the only one that's going to stay is Daniel Webster. And so this is going to be a mess. And what this is going to do is going to give the Democrats um, another opportunity to get the White House um, through uh, James K. Polk. And so James K. Polk comes into office and he is going to be prove ultimately disastrous for the Whigs as well as a democratic president because he is going to obtain um, he's going to take the country to war and gain um, uh, northern Mexico uh, through the Mexican-American War and in doing that, he unleashes and accelerates the possibility of this country going to war with itself um, in the long term. In the short term, it's definitely going to lead to some complications for the Whig Party. And so what happens after this is um, Polk, he was a one-term president, and that was um, intentional on his part. He was able to get the territory of northern Mexico right here, all of this area. 
um, and then he's out. Uh, Zachary Taylor comes to office, um, and he's kind of an unknown when it comes to um, politics, but he's 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 uh, widely popular with the American people because he was um, the general that defeated the Mexicans and we were able to get all of his territory. Um, but he got and so both the Democrats and the Whigs approach him to run for president. He goes with the Whigs. The problem with the Mexican-American War is the question of, well, what do we do with all of this land? Are we, is it going to be a free state? Are they going to be slave states? Is, is it going to upset the balance of power within Washington? And this scares to death both factions of the North and the South. So you have these sectional differences that really become strident uh, during this time period. Uh, Henry Clay devised this is the so-called Compromise of 1850. I'll go into further detail of the Compromise of 1850 in the next lecture, but suffice to say for now, the issue at hand was California wanted to be admitted to the Union as a free state. And so this was going to upset the South. And so Henry Clay basically is able to put together some provisions um, that uh, are going to... Um, placates the tensions between the North and the South by offering the South a few uh, concessions. Uh, and those concessions would be that um, there would be a stricter Fugitive Slave Act imposed um, in the territories and that Utah and New Mexico would be able to decide later if they would want to come in as slave states or free states, this popular sovereignty doctrine that would be imposed on the territories. Now Zachary Taylor would argue, uh, no, there will be no compromise. Uh, California will become in as a slave state or as a free state. Um, and if I hear any grumblings from the South, uh, including from my son-in-law, Jefferson Davis, and Jefferson Davis would later become the uh, president of the Confederate States of America once the South secedes from the Union, I will go down there and make sure that those tr people that are um, threatening treason are are hung for their crimes. And Zachary Taylor probably actually had the leadership abilities to squelch dissent at this time and to bring these people to the table. But he's going to die um, basically of cholera. He's going to eat some contaminated cherries uh, that were rinsed in water contaminated with cholera. And this guy down here, Fillmore, um, is going to become president. And he's not a very... Um, a depth leader and so the south is going to be able to walk all over this guy um, and what begins to happen is the downfall of the Whig party as a result so out of the arguments of the um, compromise of 1850 uh, between northern Whigs and southern Whigs become tensions that become um, Basically, they become irrecoverable at, at this point. People are not going to become to get along um, after the situation. Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs are going to argue against each other. Um, and this is further tensions are going to happen once we get the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. I'll go into further detail of where the Kansas-Nebraska Act came from, but for our purposes, it was the Kansas Territory uh, was basically going to be able to decide if they wanted to become a free state or a slave state. This is going to further tensions amongst the already fractured Whig Party, and it's going to destroy the Whig Party. And so this is going to give rise to the Republican Party and eventually give rise to Abraham Lincoln uh, ascending to the White House. So by 1858, the North had instilled former Whigs and former Free soil Democrats, and basically what a free soil, uh, anyone who's subscribing, subscribing to the free soil ideology would say is that we're not against slavery. Slavery can exist where it already does, but we do not want it to spread out into the territories because that will give an unfair advantage to basically the southern planter class, and it will it will curtail the American economy because it will dry up opportunities for people that could take advantage of, of, of the vast resources out in the West. If we allow the Southern planters to go out there uh, with all of their wealth, they're gonna buy up the best land and they're gonna bring their slaves with them. And this is going to eliminate any possibility for opportunity for, for people, right?
And so this free soil ideology is going to be uh, incorporated into the Republican Party. And so by 1858, fully entrenched, uh, we have the Republican Party, which is going to be successful in winning the election of 1860. And we have the Democratic Party. So we can go back to um, the timeline here to check this out. So going back to our timeline here, we can take a look at um, where the Republicans come into uh, power. So they get into power by the 1860s um, in this part of the timeline. And we have the basically the modern two-party system that we're very familiar with between the Democrats and the Republicans.